Uh, good evening and welcome to Making Michigan, the Bentley Library series on the history of the University of Michigan. I'm Gary Krenz, the director of the Judy and Stanley Frankel uh, Detroit Observatory, where we are, uh, and which is a division of the Bentley. I'm pleased to welcome both our online audience uh, on YouTube and our in-person audi audience here at the observatory. And I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge two dis distinguished guests, uh, uh, President Emerita Mary Sue Coleman and her husband Ken, uh, here, in the, here in the observatory, and online, President Emeritus James J. Duderstadt and his wife, Anne, uh, who, as I say, are online. I also note that there are a number of people, too many to name individually, both here and online, who were part of the history that we're going to discuss tonight, and of course, I hope we hear from you uh, when it comes to that point in the, uh, in the program. Uh, tonight, our topic is a library for all, U of M, Google, and the importance of having a copy. That is a topic that is, compared to some of the things we cover in the Making Michigan series, relatively recent history, but not so recent as to be front and center in our consciousness. Many, or at least some of us, can remember reading and doing research in a world of print before massive digitization, but I venture to say that we all have now become very accustomed to operating smoothly in the world of Google Books and JSTOR and HathiTrust and other things, uh, almost so that that old world looks a little quaint. Uh, the pandemic accelerated the incorporation of such platforms into our, uh, into our work and lives and also, also showed in a new way the power of this regime we, we now have. Now, I'm sure that many of you, like me, love to take a little bit of a holiday and go into the stacks and feel the texture of the book and the smell of the book and so forth. Uh, but it's really almost hard to remember what it was like to do research when what you had to have was a stack of books at your side and little, little pieces of paper marking pages that you wanted to, uh, to return to and copying things out laboriously by hand, uh, which is just to say that we now take for granted some things that were far from inevitable, uh, certainly far from inevitable with respect to timelines actually achieved and that might well have turned out differently, perhaps better, but very possibly much worse. And I imagine that many on our campus today have no idea of the role that the University of Michigan played in the creation of this world we now have. So it's an opportune time to reflect on the history of this quest for uh, a, a universal library, as it were. And I think that we will see, uh, what we will see is, of course, that while this is in part a story about technology. It is as or more importantly a story about human agents, social systems, and organizational change. And I'm really very grateful to our panelists for coming together this evening. And now it is my pleasure to introduce them in the order in which they will be speaking. Uh, the idea for this session came to me when I read this wonderful book, Along Came Google, A History of Library Digitization by our first panelist, Roger Schoenfeld. Uh, and the late Deanna Markham, who I know was a beloved member of the library community. Roger is the Vice President of Organizational Strategy for Ithaca and of Ithaca SNR's Libraries Social Scholarly Communication and Museums Program. He was previously at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and currently serves as a board member for the Center for Research Libraries. He received degrees in Library and Information Science from Syracuse University and in English Literature from Yale University. And if you'll just indul uh, uh, indulge a little bit of, a, of an interruption, my plan was to show my Kindle copy of Along with Google on my iPad, but my iPad refused to cooperate today, so I'm grateful to Nancy Bartlett from the Bentley uh, for lendi lending me her print copy of the book, and I will, let, I will let any of you draw whatever conclusion you want about what that means in the context of tonight's panel. Okay, so. Wendy Pratt Luget, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Wendy Pratt Luget served as university librarian and dean of libraries and McKnight presidential professor at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, retiring in 2020. Those libraries' programs and impact were recognized with the National Medal for Museums and Libraries and the Excellence in Academic Libraries Award. Prior to her appointment at Minnesota in 2002, Wendy held several positions at the University of Michigan over a 20-year period, including Associate Director for Digital Library Services. Her creation of a digital library program at Michigan was recognized with the American Library Association's Hugh Atkinson Award. 
She has served on numerous boards of directors in the library world. Her research and publications have focused on digital library development, information economics, assessment of research behavior, virtual organizations, and e-research. Wendy holds a BA in English from Lawrence University, an MS in Library Science from Wisconsin, and an MA in Psychology from Minnesota. John Wilkin is the Chief Executive Officer of Lyricis. Prior to joining Lyricis, Wilkin served as the Dean of Libraries at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign from 2013 to 2022, as well as UIUC's Interim Provost from 2017 to 2018. He was the founding Executive Director of Hathi Trust and served in that capacity from 2008 until 2013. Over the course of his career at U of M and Virginia, John was an early leader in the development of digital libraries focusing on combining large-scale discovery with preservation strategies. He founded the Humanities Text Initiative and led the conversion of the Middle English Dictionary, itself a multi-generational U of M project, to, dig to digital online form. He directed li digital library production in projects such as The Making of America and Peak. He collaborated in creating, creating the first legal agreement for the Google Books project, including authoring a clause that we will hear some things about tonight. <laughs> His focus on copyright and preservation played a pivotal role in Hadi Trust's fair use strategy. Paul Courant is the Edward M. Gramlich Distinguished University Professor Emeritus of Economics and Public Policy, Harold T. Shapiro Collegiate Professor Emeritus of Public Policy, and an Arthur F. Thurnau Professor Emeritus of Economics and Information here at U of M. Among many roles at U of M, Paul has served as Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs, as University Librarian and Dean of Libraries, and as Director of the Institute of Policy, Public Policy Studies, which was the predecessor of the Ford School. His academic work recently focused on economic and policy questions relating to universities, libraries, and archives, and the effects of new information technologies. He was a founding board member of both the Hadi Trust Digital Library and the Digital Public Library of America. So the panelists are going to make some remarks, uh, and then we'll have some discussion and bring the audience in through Q&A, both online and, uh, and here in the room. When we're done, the observatory upstairs is open until 9 o'clock. We have a wonderful student docents who would love to show you around, and there are some beautiful telescopes up there to look at, even if we're not going to be able to look through them tonight, given the weather. But with all that, let's get started, and Roger, the floor is yours. Thanks, thanks, Gary, so much for um, for organizing this panel tonight. Thanks to my terrific co-panelists for joining and, and everyone here. It's so nice to see so many familiar and um, and interested uh, uh, folks uh, in in these topics tonight. Um, and I do want to just take one moment to acknowledge my um, my friend and colleague Deanna Markham, who really was the animating spirit behind um, behind this book in particular, but so so much uh, so much leadership for um, for the research library community over over the years. Um, so, so I, I'd like to start my remarks, and I think end them as well, by talking a little bit about Ann Arbor, which is a place that I've never lived, but, um, but, but have been fortunate enough to visit many times. This is a place where, um, where a tremendous amount of digital library innovation took place over the course of many decades, and, um, uh, and across several generations of library leaders and university leaders, and, um, and I think that I think that that's a that's an interesting question for us to ask tonight is sort of how and why that that may have may have happened. Um, one really signal part of that leadership has been a recognition of what the university does best, does well, and does best, and where it makes sense to partner with others. And I think that that's a really interesting um, thread that we may want to pull on just just a little bit tonight. Um, so just to just to step back, for more than a century, library leaders have dreamed uh, dreamed a dream about having all information available to their to their users in in one way or another, and that started with a technology of the time, the printing press, and um, pr the production of things like union catalogs to figure out what materials were available elsewhere but not here. Um, and uh, the postal service to to lend and and, and tra transfer information across across space, um, and of course it's evolved with new technologies over the course of time. Um, I was reminded by Charles Watkinson, who's here tonight, 
um, uh, the director of the University Press at Michigan, um, that Ann Arbor has not just been a place of, of digital library innovation, but it's also been a major printing center over the years, and, um, and m maybe more recently, a place where a new generation of technology after, after the printing press, the technology of microfilm production, um, it's, it's been an important site for that as well. And microfilm was, was an, another way of making information more accessible um, over, over the course of time. We, we f easily forget some of those older technologies and some of the innovations that were necessary to, uh, to, make, to make those possible. Um, so over the last 40 years, of course, the technology revolution has moved on to digitization. And, um, and after a brief period of experimentation with moving uh, digital materials over physical objects like CD-ROMs, um, we, uh, we, we realized that we could deliver things much more efficiently and effectively over, over networks. Um, and of course, this, has unleashed a, this, this unleashed a period of projects and programs um, of experimentation by the 1990s that included at Michigan projects that I know Wendy will, will talk more about, things like um, uh, digitization and, and digital library programs like Making of America or um, the partnership with Elsevier that um, known as the Tulip Project that uh, ex ex expanded access to online scientific journals, explored how that would work, all, all sorts of individual and in, in very important <coughs> digitization and digital library services, not just in Ann Arbor and in lots and lots of lots and lots of research libraries and research universities and other kinds of sites around the country and, and well beyond. Um, but the upshot in Ann Arbor was that the infrastructure, the code, um, the expertise that was built up by a number of these projects over the course of time um, by the um, by the by the early 1990s allowed um, the Mellon Foundation when it was thinking about creating JSTOR to realize that the University of Michigan was the obvious place to create to create JSTOR and there was a whole set of engagement at that time um, not just by digital library leaders but by university leaders around you know how could how could that be made to work and the different kinds of relationships and 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 you know business uh, business relationships that were necessary to make uh, to make a, an initiative that was going to be beyond a project, but ultimately um, uh, 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 ultimately grow into a not-for-profit business. And, um, and when JSTOR became independent of the university, um, it, it, uh, it, it, still, it still has a major presence here, still has an office here. So, um, so there's, there's some very, very interesting um, uh, uh, connections. Now, JSTOR was in some ways, though, the exception at the time. So its self-sustainable business kept curating new collections and, and growing, um, but other digitization initiatives were largely project-driven or programmatic in nature and did amazing, great work in, in, in those undertakings. Um, but they didn't stand any chance of, of getting everything Digitized, and and I think that that was that recognition was was something that over time became clearer um, to library leaders as well. Um, research library leaders recognized that that a, a sort of project or programmatic approach had value, but there were efforts to improve coordination and expand resource allocation. Um, initiatives like the Digital Library Federation in its in its early days suggested just how just how challenging some of that work could could actually be. Um, and then, as Deanna and I explained in the book, in, along came Google, and and you know many other libraries contributed their collections to the Google Books project, and and it was it was truly um, the the contributions were were from many different uh, organizations, but um, but the University of Michigan was an exception, and um, Gary already mentioned uh, the the nature of the contract, the nature of the involvement um, at a provostial and presidential level in building that relationship. And Google, Google at Michigan and beyond played a, played a really, uh, uh, played a, a, an irreplaceable role as a catalyst to make possible what lots of folks had dreamed about for a long time, but ultimately couldn't be coordinated without a third party. And so Google, Google brought technology that 
that hadn't, hadn't been in wide distribution within libraries, and Google brought a lot of money to the table also. But I have come to the view that what Google brought was a third-party catalyst that could, that could really show, um, show the, the um, that could suggest to libraries and then universities that an audacious project to try to digitize everything was actually possible. And, um, and not everything worked out as, as some of my colleagues here might have, might have hoped. Um, we didn't get the kind of publicly available digital library that I think, I think many of us would have loved to have seen come out of the project. That was, in some sense, the ultimate, the ultimate dream. Um, copyright was, I think it's fair to say, the, bi the biggest barrier to that. Not, not technology, not collaboration, um, uh, not, not uh, nothing like that. But we did get we did get a copy. Uh, we, being the university sector, did get a copy, and we'll talk more about that as well um, through through the leadership of, of my my fellow panelists. Um, and that 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 made possible the creation having a copy that the university sector controlled made it possible to create Hadi Trust, and um, and made it possible. To, for the research library sector to push through some of the access limitations um, within a non-commercial space. And that was a very, um, in some ways, very unexpected outcome if, if we had tracked from the beginning of the initiative. And the fact that the catalyst to create Hadi Trust came not from outside the university, as was the case with JSTOR and the case with the Google Books project, but came from within the research university sector, um, I think is, suggests some really interesting lessons that have been learned by leaders in our community through the sustained application of attention to organizational dynamics around digital library development and collaboration. So we've ended up not with a single university, a, a single, um, a single universal digital library, and I think it's it's important to recognize what what might have been or what we might wish to have seen. The, the idea of having a single library would have been um, would have been really powerful and would have greatly improved the access to information, access to knowledge um, beyond the university. But what we have ended up with is something may be equally exciting in other ways, which is a plurality of digital libraries. And I, I think, you know, we could probably re reflect a little bit on what it means to have a, a, single, a single big thing versus a plurality of many things. There's trade-offs as, as, as ever between those two kinds of approaches. Um, the, um, the plurality of them is loosely coupled together rather than, rather than, a, single, rather than a single thing. So I think that's a, a very important distinction. So we haven't achieved everything that, that might have been dreamed of, um, but what has been achieved, I, I want to close by pointing out, couldn't have been achieved um, without the leaders here with me today, um, others like them, many of, m many of you here in the room actually. Um, and, and I think the fact that so much of this development took place within the context of a single university, a uh, single place, over the course of multiple generations of leadership is, um, is, is a really singular example in our community and, and something that, that, uh, that, that merits a, a lot of both reflection as well as, as well as celebration. So I'm going to stop there and look forward to the rest of the discussion. So I feel like the record needs to show I'm, I'm here to talk about the prehistory, you know, the what happened before all of this. And I'm the only one using technology with my notes. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are uh, all in the paper world. This, so. is, this is technology. It's <laughs> yeah, there you go. So I need to say up front that what I'm about to say is, is drawing on history that's three decades old. And there's a certain risk to that, right? Um, but maybe the, the non-risky side is that we can maybe distill some themes, some, some milestones that uh, we'll talk about later and that might be relevant. I should say a fair amount has been written about the, this early chapter at Michigan, and I was going to point out all the people that have written things, but there's way too many of them in the audience, so I, I won't, but you know who you are. Um, so let me take you back to the early 90s, 1991, University of Minnesota uh, released the Gopher Protocol, 
which is sort of the first blush of being able to get at structured information and make it accessible online. 93, uh, the web protocol came on board, and then a little bit later that year, Mosaic uh, was released. And on campus, we were seeing the rise of distributed computing. And the institutional question is sort of how do you put these two things together? On the one hand, the infrastructure that sort of democratizes access to technology and the possibility to share information. And uh, how, do we, how do we move this forward? So into that uh, space enter uh, the Trinity. Uh, Dan Atkins, who was the Dean of the School of Information, Don Riggs, who was the Dean of the Library, and Doug Ben Howling, who was CIO and head of the Information Technology Division. And they agreed to partner, to coalesce the expertise and resources of their three organizations, and uh, asked me in 1993 to step away from my role as director of the Graduate Library to uh, help them out. Now, we didn't know what to call it, uh, there wasn't a construct in our vocabulary of digital libraries, so we privately just called it the 3D initiative, and that was not dealing with virtual reality. It was Dan, Don, and Doug, <laughs> and Wendy. The simple mandate I was given was to sort of harness this complementary expertise to engage in projects that would sort of demonstrate the potential and seize opportunities that arose, like JSTOR. Um, and if possible, along the way, address some things about economics and policy. A phrase I'm gonna steal from my colleague, John, um, that he mentioned in preparing for this, is I think it was a distinctive moment in time when all of a sudden the leadership, the resources, the motivations all coalesced to get some things done. We uh, had, uh, a pledge from the three Ds that they would provide the resources. They also provided the independence. Uh, I was able to do pretty much what I wanted, which was kind of fun, um, but also with their guidance and, and uh, I suppose ultimately they were responsible for things, so, but we accomplished a lot. I reported to them directly, uh, so we met frequently to talk about the shape of things and how we could really help their own organizations as well um, in building the, the what's to come. Now there were probably a good several dozen projects that ensued and I'm not going to go through all of them but I want to just pick out three that I think surfaced some kind of fascinating questions along the way. The first is one no one has ever heard about I'm sure, it's lost in history, um, but the Department of Commerce, and this was pre-web, had a service called the Economic Bulletin Board. It was put online in a kind of kludgy way. We thought, well, we can do better. So we downloaded the data every night by telephone uh, and then put it up, I think, ultimately with Gopher uh, to make it accessible. The reason I mention this is a couple things happened. One, the feds were furious and made us take it down. And we, we saw that later when we wanted to include government documents in, uh, in Google Books and in Hathi Trust that there was uh, skepticism and there was also issues of trust. Can we trust Michigan? And that may be a mantra we, we will hear a little more about. The second issue was quality. Who, who gives the imprimatur that you're really representing the content appropriately? And the third was preservation. Commerce took down the data every night and didn't archive it. So how are those data going to be available in the long term? So I think those three issues are worth, worth keeping uh, in our minds. The second project I want to mention, and it's really a kind of suite of projects that's been alluded to. Uh, we did have two efforts with uh, Elsevier Science, the publisher. One uh, called Tulip, dealing with material science journals. But the second one called PEAK stood for Pricing Electronic Access to Knowledge. We worked with Jeff Mackey Mason, who was uh, then a, an economist at the School of Information. And Elsevier let us host all 1,200 journals here prior to the time that they had a viable commercial service. They let us design the economic models, and then we delivered the content to 12 different institutions, offering them different economic possibilities. Now what we learned uh, along the way, I think, was first of all about users. They don't want any speed bumps, no paywalls, no, uh, we, we inserted uh, e-commerce in there, they didn't like that. 
We learned that libraries wanted to have enduring access to the content. So if they were offered an option that didn't give them that, they, they certainly didn't want it. And the third was that both users and libraries wanted comprehensive coverage and that back then Elsevier thought, oh, things like letters to the editor can't be all that important, right? We should just not include those in the journal or smaller articles, those sorts of things. So those, that was a real learning experience and certainly useful as we were asked to uh, take on JSTOR. And JSTOR, along with Peak, really helped us test our muscle about infrastructure and where we had some, some vulnerabilities. Um, but like many loose partnerships, which is what JSTOR was, I'm not going to go into the whole history of JSTOR, Roger's written a marvelous book, but it was a loose partnership with Mellon and Michigan, and ultimately it too needed to scale and uh, became an independent organization, which was not without some bumps in the road um, uh, in terms of transitioning staff and infrastructure. But I think that is a useful example too of what we'll talk about with Google Books and Hathi Trust. When do you reach the point in scale where you need to have dedicated staff, you need to have, um, doc you needed to have um, sustainability, you needed to have governance, all of those issues. So I think, again, that's the sort of take home points from that project. And the last project I want to highlight is our first attempt at large scale digitization. And I use quotes because it was not large at all, and that was Making of America. This was funded by Mellon, and we were scanning uh, American history volumes from the 19th century. They were falling apart. And we were working with uh, Cornell University Library, and they had done an awful lot to document the standards for digitization. They wanted to select titles one by one that they thought would be important. They wanted high quality, and then they wanted to produce a print reproduction. Michigan's approach was a little, a little different. Uh, I think we just took big buckets of, of content off the shelf. I can't think of the right word, uh, but um, we didn't look into the selection because we didn't know what users would really want once they had good functionality and search capability. And that's where we put the emphasis on the infrastructure, the search, the, the how to make a really functional thematic digital library. <coughs> So I think what I've described here, uh, and I should say Making of America had a second grant from Mellon to document all those standards, the economics, and uh, the processes. So what I've described is really the piece parts that made Michigan one of, if not the premier digital library at the time in the country. We had all the piece parts of infrastructure, attention to user behavior. We understood a lot more about how content functions and how it's differently structured. We learned a little bit about economics and sustainability and certainly learned a lot about scale, which was something that was really going to be necessary if we would take projects and move them to something bigger. I want to end by coming back to that point of that phrase of moment in time. And it truly was when all the planets aligned and collaboration was strong. But ultimately, leadership changed. Uh, people moved on to different roles. Um, and the digital library program was more fully incorporated in the library, where I think it maybe had a rightful leadership uh, role. There certainly were tensions over time between organizations internal to the library as the program gained more and more national recognition and drew dollars from uh, lots of grants and other sources. So it was, a, it was a heady time, but a fascinating time to sort of birth something that powerful. Uh, I left in 2002, um, but I think I was forever branded as part of the Michigan Mafia, as it was called. Uh, and I did continue to be involved through the Big Ten in the Google Books project, certainly. I was on the settlement committee and also on the Hathi Trust board. So I think that brings us to the point in the program where we really need to get to the heart of the plot line. I'm going to turn things over to John. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, here, I wanna, first I want to just revel on the moment. Uh, Gary, thank you uh, for doing this. Um, so I'm sitting between 
two of my heroes and, and bosses, right? So um, this is, for me, this is really special, and I just want to thank you. Your time card is over, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, Ro Roger did a really nice job of, of describing what, what happened in that uh, sort of the, the, the Google digitization thing, and, and Wendy, that leading up to that moment in time. And I want to talk a little bit more about the, the moment in time and some of the things that came together. But before I do, I want to... Um, I want to start with uh, kind of the end of the story. I want to start uh, with the, the agreement that, that we struck with Google. And, and I want to make a point here that a lot of times people think that these are happy accidents, that, uh, that, that you know, we got this collective uh, thing uh, really because we were, I mean, we stumbled into it. Um, Mike Furlow uh, over there, uh, executive director of Howdy Trust, I think a lot of people have said that the emergency temporary access service that it just uh, during the pandemic it was it was an accident that that we had that and and I want to tell you all that these things were very very intentional <laughs> that, uh, that we we built these structures to do these things and and so starting at the end here I want to start with that clause that uh, that uh, uh, Roger referred to. Um, this is online, you can find it, the agreement uh, clause is 4.4.2, uh, and it's uh, called Use of the U of M Digital Copy in Cooperative Web Services. Um, that clause was very, very purposeful. It was foundational for us. It gave us the right to use the copy provided to Michigan, quote, in whole or in part at U of M's sole discretion as part of services offered in cooperation with partner research libraries. Um, I, I gotta say, you know, Larry Page uh, was comfortable with this. David Drummond, who was general counsel, was comfortable with this. But when the other senior people in Google read that clause, they, they, they thought, what the hell did they do? What, why are they giving away this, this, uh, this capability? Um, we, we negotiated that clause uh, after, I, I want to say, uh, very, very intentionally, after laboring for a decade uh, in efforts that Wendy described here, trying to bring the community together in, in collective efforts. Wendy was co-PI along with our friend and late colleague Ann Kenny in the first Making Amer of America effort. And Mark Sandler uh, and I traveled to Ithaca to bring research libraries together to try to leverage that to do collective work. And there was no interest. Uh, uh, Mark, for years, worked on something called Project G Janus, trying to get libraries to collectively work together on these problems, and there was no interest. I worked on something called the Registry of Digital Masters to try to coordinate activity, and there was no interest. And we pushed and pushed and pushed. And this felt like the opportunity to make things happen. This was really for us uh, the ability to make a library for all. So it may not be uh, a library for all. I think there's still hope that we may be able to get more rights of use in the future, uh, but, uh, but it is a, an immense library. Uh, and so beginning with Making of America and a lot of things that, that happened afterwards, we were trying to get to this point in time. Um, we might delve into questions about why things fail, and I think uh, these sorts of things fail, and I think there's probably a good panel to be uh, developed on that. Um, but the leadership at the university, the leadership in the library, um, uh, believed that that this was an essential thing, that, uh, that if we could do this, that it would ultimately um, promote access and preservation in a paired way. This, was, this is what was in mind from the beginning. And I want to I wanna emphasize that uh, before uh, going into uh, to a little bit of the, that moment in time. So what we were doing then wasn't the brainchild of a single person. And I want to I wanna emphasize that. And I think this is really why we were successful. It was the objective of leadership uh, uh, throughout the library and the university. Um, the late Bill Gosling uh, endorsed what we were doing. Wendy was a significant part of it, Mark, as I mentioned. Um, but many people in the room here were, were working together to try to make this happen. There are a lot of people who saw the value and the vision in trying to make things happen. It was endorsed by university leadership. Uh, Dan Atkins, who was online, was uh, a big proponent of, of these sorts of things. Uh, and, and, and uh, I, you know, there was a sort of 
it was in the air. It was something we were all doing. I think we can call it the dream of a universal library, but it was ultimately, I would say, a very practical vision for uh, uh, understood in uh, ways that we could serve our constituency uh, by using properly specified uh, digital copies as surrogates of the print uh, to provide access. This was really uh, the heart of what we were, we were trying to do. So um, I'm going to uh, dig down a little bit more on that moment in time piece here, uh, the digitization deal and the creation of Heidi Trust. It came about through efforts of a lot of people. And I, I want to try to try to capture that the flavor of that moment. Um, one of the people who was a part of this, and there are a lot of uh, people who you know, don't, won't, won't show up in the history books necessarily, uh, was uh, John Alger, who was Assistant General Counsel, uh, and, uh, and he got involved very early in, in the conversations. Jack Bernard, uh, in the back of the room, was working with, with John, and John had no hesitations about supporting this. He understood the risks. Uh, 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 Jack was helping to flesh out what the copyright issues were, but he saw it as, as a big thing for the university, and uh, we were winding down the Supreme Court case around affirmative action, and John was bold enough to say, maybe this is the next big battle. Uh, he was gone when it was a big battle, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it was, uh, you know, it was the next big battle. Um, when uh, we uh, describe the shape of the project uh, for the uh, communications team led by Lisa Rogers, who was VP for communications. She endorsed the ideas. She said to everybody in the room, this is it, we're doing this. Uh, and uh, she ensured the support of President Coleman. And, and that was, was significant. Uh, uh, President Coleman uh, championed the project uh, privately, uh, uh, for example, with the regions, uh, and there's probably a, a good story to be told there, no, or not. Uh, so, uh, uh, but, but publicly, and I have to turn to my notes here because I'm going to read here um, the speech that she made uh, before the Association of American Publishers, Google, the Khmer Rouge, and the Public Good was described in the press as a stinging rebuke of publishers, and in it she argued, quote. The University of Michigan's partnership with Google offers three overarching qualities that help fulfill our mission. The preservation of books, worldwide access to information, and most importantly, the public good of the diffusion of knowledge. This is a university, of pre a university president uh, advancing these ideas in the lion's den. It was, it was a powerful moment. Um, within the library, uh, the, the senior managers, all those managers who reported to uh, the leadership, uh, uh, came together around this. Uh, there wasn't a dissenting voice. Our, our teams really uh, worked on making this happen. But uh, most profoundly, and he can uh, blush at this point, uh, as Provost uh, Paul Carant's endorsement was the most critical and really ensured that others got on board. He understood the value of the project uh, and the voice, uh, the, value, the value of the voice that he would bring, and he committed to funding uh, what we needed to do in, in the university without having a price tag. He said, we're going to do this. We're going to fund this. Um, and, and, you know, it, it didn't turn out to be a crazy idea, but, um, but it was, you know, it was, it was dangerous. It was a risk, I think. Uh, it would have been impossible uh, to accomplish what we did with limited support, um, but the broad and enthusiastic uh, support, the institutional support across the board was really what made the project uh, uh, successful. Um, you know, we talked about the Michigan difference. Uh, the institution really was, I, I think, the only place that this, this could happen. I will note that there was a, a parallel agreement being struck at Stanford, and you don't hear about Stanford in this context at all, um, because they weren't seeing the potential in the same way. It was, it was uh, not the same institutionally, and there was no vision for what could happen in this, so, um, uh, in, this in this space. Um, uh, despite uh, messages like uh, President Coleman's, it's all too easy to be cynical about the notion that Michigan was committed to advancing the interests of the public. Um, when Michigan, along with the University of California, uh, before the, uh, 
project was public, uh, sought funding from Mellon and Ithaca to shape a collaborative effort. As Roger and Deanna note in the book, um, a prominent Mellon program officer declared, and I'm going to quote here, uh, Michigan really wanted the help for itself. That's the quote. Uh, and not for the collective interest of the community. And I think uh, as, I, you know, the quote that I've given you in the clause and what I've described here and what we see in history, I think that that really demonstrates that that was not the case. This was really about the community. Um, uh, uh, I hope I'm not stealing your thunder, but as Paul said earlier this evening, there's no block M on the elephant in Hadi Trust. Um, this really is a, a, a community effort. Um, did I steal something? Yeah, that's right. I'll Shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and we really did uh, clearly articulate the, the intentions, and they really were rooted in years of work. And I'm going to end with uh, one, one thing um, here as an example of what becomes possible when you have the public interests um, um, at, at, at heart. Um, we have long known that a significant part of publishing in the 20th century is in the public domain. There are lots of canards about how much of it is in the public domain. But because of the large body of, of digital content and of the community effort, um, we've uh, mounted an effort that is going on to this day, the copyright review management system. Um, more than a million books have been reviewed, and more than 600,000 of them have been open to the public. It is absolutely impossible to imagine something like that happening before we did this. As Wendy said, the Making of America project was very big, 12,000 volumes. Um, that was very big. And, and what we've done subsequently, because of the scale, uh, has uh, made a, a tremendous difference. And I think that is uh, the, the copyright review management system is just one manifestation of what, what happens when you devote yourself to the public good. Thank you. So I'll start with the, the, the big block M uh, <laughs> and the fact that there is no big block M in any of the Hadi Trust materials. Um, it's a, a, a sort of confused elephant that based on my <laughs> friends who uh, tell me that, who know something about elephants, um, who tell me that it's, it's, it's a, some sort of hybrid Indian elephant and African elephant. Thing. So it's not even, <laughs> not even true to elephantness. Um, although we, uh, we very much like the idea that the Hathi Trust would be named for elephants who are wise, uh, live a long time. Um, and that's very much what we wanted libraries to do. So I'm mostly going to talk about various animating visions that have come along as these projects develop and then suggest that there might be a future you know, this is a pretty good start, but come on, let's get down to, uh, get down to, to business. Um, and inst we, building things of this size, well, I'll back up. Scale is very much what is in play in these discussions. We have, we, we talk in terms of millions of volumes where that isn't the way we used to talk. Google, uh, from the very beginning as a, as a corporation, um, was unafraid of scale. Um, you can do a lot if you're not afraid of scale. Uh, and you can especially do a lot if you're not afraid of scale in the information space because once a piece of information is developed, you can distribute it around to the world, you can distribute it to the future um, uh, very inexpensively. Um, and so you, there's a lot of scale to take advantage of. And one way to evaluate the, these kinds of projects the work we've been talking about today and, and extensions of it is, is it exploiting scale, right? If it isn't, eh, it's not so special. Somebody else maybe should do it. But we've got the biggest digital library in the world now in the Hadi Trust, and that is to be exploited, and we can indeed exploit it. I want to make another claim, so another claim about vision. So let's worry about scale. Um, and, uh, and one way in which we do that, by the way, is Gee, a thing we're trying to do is make it easy for people to get their use copy uh, electronically because that's, again, the copy you want to use to get your work done um, is, is readily available. I want to, for a moment, just talk about why higher education is wonderful in this context. It has remarkable reach. 
we universities and their kinder their, uh, and their kin invent and produce everything, right? There's nothing out there that you read about in the newspaper um, that comes to you through other media. There's nothing out there that doesn't have work done by the kinds of people who live in universities, who nurture universities, who are nurtured by universities, who have ambitions at the scale of universities, and then perforce at the scale of really big libraries uh, in the context of universities. And so, so, uh, so the institutions that invent and produce everything, I claim, are humanity at its best, learning and doing, aspiring to advance understanding and the quality of life. Um, we make and use knowledge. Um, and so when Mary Sue in that speech to the publishers um, uh, said, we're, we're, we're not in it for us, we're in it for the broader society, uh, I find that to be entire, entirely cre credible. Uh, at, and we were talking about it that way from the beginning. I have to shout out a little bit ambiguously to our colleague Lisa Rogers. She really would have liked it if we'd been able to put an M on that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, was a, it was a tough time in the economy. It was a tough time in the Michigan economy. Here was this project that was getting very good you know, um, play. And gee, couldn't have given us one block M, but, <laughs> but no. Uh, so universities require libraries, which provide a continuing powerful instance of how we find and employ knowledge, which is to say, among other things, to share knowledge relatively easily and find <coughs> uses for things that we don't know. That's, uh, that's more or less what we're doing. The 3D um, gang of, of Wendy's, three, and fourth is a D in Wendy. <laughs> yeah, there's a D in uh, Wendy. <laughs> um, um, that's, that's an amazing story, because there wasn't a developed um, shared vision of doing something exciting then. There were three leaders within an institution who were smart enough to see talent, no talent when they saw it, who said, OK, you know what? Let's do this. Um, and we weren't at that point at all sure where that would yeah. head. But it could head somewhere, and it turned out it really did. If that's not in the background, then there's much less to grab onto when the, when the later stuff came along. Uh, so, uh, so I want to sketch for just a second uh, uh, an a piece of animating vision, uh, with, which uh, suppose that pretty much everything that had ever been published were available online pretty much everywhere, and that the legal and technical environments were such that the works would continue to be available reliably for the indefinite future, pretty much forever, on reasonable terms. In such a world, it would of course be easy to create networks of knowledge using source material consisting of almost everything that was available almost everywhere. And that leads to the question behind this discussion in my mind. Why have we been unable, for all the wonderful things we've done, to organize libraries, universities, the publishing industry, and related institutions to create such rich networks? And what will it take to get there, or at least to get much closer? And what we've been brought to here is, that is now a coherent question. Right? And that was, you know, Paul Conway's not in his head. That was not a coherent question when we, um, when we uh, got into doing this, doing this work. Um, one of the things that enabled the progress that we've made uh, is that the Hadi Trust, well, the, the work was done in Ann Arbor, in Michigan. And so we had uh, uh, we had a, a rich structure that you could do things in. As provost, I could make commitments on behalf of the university, including a commitment to fund preservation costs for U of M's holding in the Hadi Trust, and it was indeed that funding and preservation cost that enabled us mm -hmm. to uh, um, make, make such use of the, uh, of the clause mm -hmm. uh, of joining data uh, across lots of institutions. Um, so, um, so we could 
we could employ the university. We could talk about it. We didn't, I didn't have carte blanche to do everything I wanted to do, but there was an understanding in the library world and in the university that the Google Book Project was a partnership with the university and with other universities, and that gave us a great deal of flexibility. We could actually make credible statements about what the future was going to look like. Um, and um, that's, you know, that takes an enormous amount of leadership uh, within the institution. I'll shout out again to Mary Sue on that because she was amazing um, and she was, was a steadfast uh, champion of this project. And she always, you know, in addition to saying, yes, you know, this looks like it's working, it's cool, she basically said, you know, I, she really liked it. <laughs> uh, and indeed, a piece of leadership is to convey to people who are doing the work that the leaders um, really like it uh, and care about it. Uh, I know Jack got mentioned already uh, in the context of Jonathan. Let me tell you, though, you want to get something done? Have a boss who really likes it and have a lawyer who really likes it. <laughs> because sometimes what lawyers do is they wander through the world making things more difficult than they already are. Uh, that's a respectable way of being. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's not, not good for innovation. Uh, Jack absolutely thought that this work was the most important thing he was doing. Um, and, uh, and I think he was right about that. Um, and because, uh, because it was difficult, because there were lawsuits, complicated lawsuits, interesting lawsuits. By the way, it's not fun if you're just an ordinary school teacher like me uh, to, uh, to uh, be called a liar publicly uh, in environments that are filled with people who are nominally who you would have thought of as your friends. But that's certainly what we did uh, in the lawsuits around, uh, uh, around Google. So uh, I want to get into uh, questions and answers. So, um, um, so, uh, which one? Piece, yeah. So I'll skip over the the one thing I will say is that the the uh, ethos, the use of the uh, of the the uh, how do you trust digital copies here at, at, at the University of California. Uh, we showed us, became, become the obvious experimental use case that says, you want to run a library uh, and use the digital collection to run your library and make the works available to people digitally? Um, you think that that's very difficult? Oh, gee, we did it. Um, um, and we did it, um, we could do it because we'd won the lawsuit, because that clause was operational, you could do it. Um, and so we were able to, we're basically, I think that, by the way, is a proof that we should try to go to the next step uh, uh, and not just do it in the context of, we shouldn't need a pandemic uh, in order to be able to use our library collections um, uh, sensibly. And we now, the pandemic has showed us that we know how to use our library collections sensibly. So uh, whatever we do, we should work towards being able to use that digital copy as the principal used, co used copy, this is a case, one of those rare cases of a policy proposal that would accomplish valuable goals better, faster, and cheaper. They always tell you in business school that you can't do all three, you can only do two. This is one where we actually could do uh, all three. Uh, um, if we could get institutions, other institutions to cooperate, which I think we could. So here we are. We have rich resources, data, text, print, and more. Chatbots now, too. Mm -hmm. uh, physically and logically organized to use and to share to make a better world, to make the academy work better. We have the capacity to get pretty much everywhere into the, into, into the uh, indefinite future. Let's take that vision and run. And what better place to run it from than Michigan, mm -hmm. which has shown us that it knows how to make the future with a little bit of help from its friends. Well, thank, thank you all so much. That, that was wonderful. There are so many knowledgeable people in the room and online. I want to get to the audience questions uh, as quickly as we can, but maybe we could just do a couple of things. Uh, and one is, obviously, you know, there are two, there, there, I mean, there, there's Google Books and there's Hadi Trust. 
And I venture that most of the people in this room and many online understand this distinction. But I also think that a fair bit of our audience probably doesn't. And I wonder if somebody could just basically lay out the relationship of the two, uh, and maybe that will uh, spur some reflections on, on uh, what the significance of that relationship might be or what the significance of the differences might be. And Gary, you mean one of the panelists? Yes, right, one of the panelists. <laughs> You're joking because there are other people in the room. Okay, room. Well, I mean, I'm happy to. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. We, we, I mean, we have a microphone. I'm happy. Uh, you know. I'm going to do a, just a, a little piece here. So, how do you trust is the is the amalgamation of a of a number of libraries and their digitized content, most of which comes from Google, but there are many, many uh, uh, volumes. Um, uh, I have no idea what the number is. Mike Furlow does, but but I'm going to guess well over a million that are from other digitization efforts, things with the Internet Archive, local digitization. So there's a Venn diagram that has a, a fairly significant overlap, but there are many things that we, we have done on our own to, to pool into this uh, collective uh, digital library run by, uh, by uh, our, you know, our, our, our world, the, the libraries. Um, it's also worth saying that Google digitized more volumes than are in Hadi Trust, and that's uh, uh, you know a, uh, um, uh, a reflection of some institutions not coming into the partnership, uh, but there is always that potential. Can I add one thing to that? Um, so what John said is is correct, but I think there is uh, is also a, a governance distinction uh, with respect to Google just came and took big right. chunks of content to uh, digitize, whereas Hathi Trust has been more intentional about um, where emphases need to, to be put. You know, and I mentioned earlier government documents, a big push to get all of government information there, and then uh, other things that were identified. So even though Google did some selection based on known strengths at individual libraries, I don't think they really, it wasn't their intent to really um, prioritize what should be done next. Yeah, and I, I focused on the content, but uh, but that's really not the operative thing. Google is a corporation, and How Do you Trust is a, collect, a collective of libraries using that governance that Wendy described to, to, to do um, to do digital preservation on a body of material that is the reflection of our, our collecting over um, our histories. And just, I mean, we said this to ourselves and to others over and over and over again. Hadi Trust is an entity of the universities and the academy. It's an academic library of a kind, uh, of a new and quite special kind. Google's Google. Yeah. Um, and uh, they did amazing things. Uh, they did at one, and, and when they came in originally, they just, they took, you know, how do we put it, bucket swaths yeah. off the shelves, digitized them, sent them back. Um, but they were, they whatever, they had lots of reasons that I admire, and, and implicitly lots, several that I don't, uh, in what they were up to. But the, what they were not up to, first and foremost, was creating a first-rate digital academic library. That was us. Thank you. So I want to say to people online uh, that if you have questions, uh, please type them into the chat uh, on YouTube. Uh, and we have Andrew here who is monitoring that, and we'll pass them on. Uh, and people in the audience, I think, can, uh, can raise hands. We can do that. We, we, we know how to do that, right? <laughs> now that we've been out of, out of COVID for, for a few months. Um, uh, but le but let, me ask just, let me ask another question. Um, uh, and, and maybe this goes mostly to you, Paul, because you mentioned uh, being called a liar. And uh, there were certainly a fair number of people in the, uh, in the academic community uh, who were not behind uh, what was going on for lots of different reasons. I mean, particularly with Google, particularly concerns about Google, uh, about uh, uh, a commercial uh, entity being in charge of such a vast amount of information, uh, even worries, I guess, about algorithms perhaps skewing uh, access to material and things like that. And I wonder, I wonder yours and others' reflections uh, about that and, uh, and, and what, what came out of those. I mean, where are things now in that respect? Well, I don't know exactly where things are now, uh, actually, because Google, the Google Book Project is, um, they're still digitizing a few books, but mm -hmm. there isn't, uh, isn't, isn't much going on. Um, the, the, uh, the, there were many academics 
who I took very seriously at the time, uh, who did not like elements of Google being involved to the extent it was there. And also, now we're getting deeper into the weeds that we're going to. There was a, there was a lawsuit um, uh, and a, there was a settlement agreement amongst the publishers, um, Google, the libraries, um, and the authors guild, mm -hmm. uh, and that um, that was where the concerns about about there being only one copy or or Google being in charge of one copy was going to be a serious issue. At the same time, there was also concern about privacy, the kind of business that Google was likely to run using its version. They wouldn't be using our version, which would be which would be somewhat different. Um, could be one in which there would be dangers of privacy issues uh, being exploited. Those are real issues. There's no question about it. Um, uh, I never thought that uh, sort of uh, monopoly one copy, Google, that Google would sort of be in charge of all the world's information if it digitized all the world's information. In fact, I thought it was going to be really easy for us to take our copy uh, and make it available in, uh, in various ways. Uh, stop there. Okay. Questions from the audience? Yes. If, if you could wait for the, if you could use the microphone, we want to we want to capture it for the. That's an amazing combination of talks and filled in a lot of questions I had. I am still wondering at what point uh, the uh, acquisition into the Hathi Trust expanded beyond University of Michigan to say University of Minnesota uh, and Yale libraries. Uh, and uh, I also wonder, uh, will non-university members ever have free access to the Hathi Trust? Or are there uh, barriers that will always stand? It's worth pointing out that anyone can search Hathi Trust. It's just the ability to, to download. Um, so, you know, it's there. If it's in the public domain, you can search it. I mean, you can you can view it, yeah. and you can search it if it's if it's copyright protected. So you don't have to be a member of Hathi Trust. And I think certainly the board uh, five years ago maybe uh, changed the pricing and membership model such that it lowered the bar for entry to a lot of small institutions. I would have been happier if ETOS had been available to all Hathi Trust members, mm -hmm. not just the ones that whose particular you know collection was being used. But I, there were legal reasons for being concerned with that. I, that's a place where I hope the system will go in the future. And my first question: uh, I, I have the impression that I have the impression that the Hathi Trust uh, was an experiment at the University of Michigan, and not even on solid legal grounds. And at some point it expanded to other universities. Uh, or, or do I have a misimpression of that? I, I think you have a misimpression, and I'll try to, I'll try to clarify a bit. So um, you, uh, the, uh, the Hathi Trust started in the beginning as a, as a uh, collective uh, uh, group. Um, the original partners were the, the 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 Big Ten Academic Alliance, or the, what was called the CIC at the time, and the University of California system, but but immediately uh, we were working on trying to expand it beyond those institutions to others. There was never any sense that it was a closed club, right? The idea was uh, how how could we find a way to 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 be as expansive as possible. So um, you know by the um, the, 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 you know, the first constitutional convention, and that's what we called it, um, there were 50 or more institutions already in, and the pricing model was designed to um, uh, provide a way for other institutions to participate in ways that were reflective of the, the collection that they had and the resources they brought to the table. And as Wendy said, as time passed, um, the, the pricing model be, uh, lowered more barriers. So it, it, it was, from the beginning, a collective enterprise. Does that make sense? Yeah? It, it may also be worth sharing, not, not exactly responsive to your question, but even the effort to get those initial partners to uh, to see the wisdom of coming together collectively was was a bit of a challenge, right? right? And um, 
the, you know, I think, John, I think it was in your talk that you spoke a little bit about some of the ways that it was not always obvious that libraries could work collectively. And there was something about this moment and some of the leadership that, you know, that you and Paul and others um, provided that made it, um, made it possible to force, uh, and I think force is probably not an inaccurate term to sort of force a larger collaboration to come off the ground. And I think, um, I think, I think, you know, and then of course it expanded quite a bit from, from right. there. So very interesting story. Yeah, Roger's right. There were some, some ruptures in the beginning that were, that were uh, awkward, uncomfortable, but, but as he's saying, there was also a tipping point too. And I think that, uh, that the tipping point was reached, uh, uh fairly quickly and, and, uh, and, then brought in many, many more institutions. Uh, so, Wendy, you, you, uh, the first pro, the first of the of the projects that you mentioned, you said, you, you sort of said that one of the things that uh, uh, that you learned coming out of that was the, these three important issues: trust, quality, and preservation. And um, I just wonder about, uh, are there any reflections on sort of the development of those values through, through, through this whole history that we're talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the issue of trust has come up a, a couple of times here, both in terms of getting other institutions to join into the Hathi Trust. Um, I think resources also played a little bit of a issue sometimes in getting institutions to join but um, you know when when one institution is is holding most of the marbles and uh, you know you have to trust them that they are doing it for a public good the issue of quality was an interesting one in that um, I mentioned that Cornell had developed standards for digitization but it took quite a while uh, you know at least five six seven years before the research library community blessed those standards and there's people in the audience that can, can speak to that as well, um, and to, to really codify what those standards meant. The preservation issue, I think, is still an enduring one, um, that people understand copying something, making a digital copy, is perhaps preserving the content, but we pay not enough attention to how we then preserve the digital bits. And that, uh, I know, is... is in many institutions, something that's that's hard to get funded, uh, a digital preservation system. So, um, so those issues are still around. I don't know if any of you want to comment on them. Well, I think you've you've hit on important ones. Yeah, I I, I think trust, though, Gary, is also I think the, uh, uh, the you know there's a key piece about um, about uh, the. The library is owning a copy in Hadi Trust as opposed to Google, and there's a there's a big trust piece there. I think that um, that that there is more trust placed in uh, the collective activity of the of the the libraries uh, and their ownership than in what Google might do with a copy. Mm -hmm. It's great to see the four of you together, um, and Mary Sue too. Um, I'm Paul Conway. Um, I, uh, I did a little bit of research on quality, so that's what I wanted to, to mention. Um, I sat in John's office when I started this work, and John, I think everybody here has the ability to talk to somebody in your office and not show your cards at all. Um, it, uh, maybe that's part of what leadership becomes, but the, um, the, the point where I want to go with this is, is the quality piece. And um, when John and I talked at the beginning of the research I did, which was in response to scholarly criticism of Google's quality of both the metadata and the image quality. And I took on the image quality. And the results maybe helped calm things down because most of the quality of the images wasn't that bad, but when it was bad, it was fatal. And so you could separate fatal quality from just not great imaging. Um, but uh, the point, um, what the, the issue of quality, there's trust, quality, and preservation. And Hathi Trust, perhaps with, with um, the Internet Archive, stands alone as being motivated first by preservation. 
And there's no, almost no other examples than that. And then trust, we've been talking about. So that you're left with what's the quality factor that comes with um, the distinctiveness of, of assembling other people's content into something that you then own and or own intellectually and deliver. And um, the, the debate I had with John when John didn't show his cards was is, is the issue is should Hati Trust establish its own set of quality standards that distinguish higher, that distinguish the value of Hati Trust as a quality source of information as opposed to Google or the, the, the stuff that gets uploaded by users into Internet Archive and the other large scale things. And um, I've never been quite sure um, that uh, about the quality commitment piece of Hati Trust. Um, maybe I've, um, I'm out of the loop right in the immediate thinking, but for the first decade, it's like, let's get the preservation work done, let's get the infrastructure right, let's build an interface, let's collect the content. And then, um, but we're not gonna fork. Mm -hmm. Hati Trust isn't necessarily gonna become an authoritative source of quality, which is often what sets a library apart from piles of other stuff. So I'm wondering, it's more like, if this is a future question, or where Hathi Trust is going, is where, where is Hathi Trust as establishing itself as an authoritative source of quality information, as opposed to just a large collection of digitized material? I think it's great, I mean, it's not yeah. a criticism. It's more looking forward to, what would make Hathi Trust impossible to ignore and therefore meet its preservation goals as well? I, uh, well, I want to weigh into this a, li a little bit, but, uh, but, uh, but not in a way that represents Hathi Trust because I think, um, to, to be fair, n no one of the four of us represents Hathi Trust. So that's a question that, uh, that, that maybe Mike Furlow uh, could ask, uh, could answer, but but I want to talk a little bit about um, the digital and digital preservation and what we pay attention to in this space and what we were paying attention to in the digitization effort with Google, what we paid attention to prior to the digitization effort with Google. We pay attention to a, a number of things. One is the 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 um, reliability of the reproduction and the work that uh, Wendy referred to uh, earlier. At, at Cornell was about uh, was about resolution. Uh, it was about uh, standards for for capture, essentially, to ensure that you have something that is a, a reliable representation of the original. And that's something we spent a lot of time with Google on. I think there's not a full appreciation of what's behind the scenes with Google digitization. Very very large raw images from which derivatives are created that uh, meet our specifications. So it gives them an opportunity to iterate over the original to produce a better and better copy over time. And we did testing to ensure that the uh, originals uh, captured all of the, uh, of the information. So one piece is reproducibility, right? And the next is the, the, next is, uh, the portability the, of the standards of the, of the file formats. And for, for us, uh, the, the question with Go for Google was um, uh, the matter, the, the issue in our specifications and our contracts was getting a copy of the file that met our specifications, not just for, for uh, reproducibility, but for file format standards, uh, the standards that we used in the community. Google can store whatever they want to, but from which uh, they uh, generate these these masters that meet our specifications, right? So that's the second piece. I, I tend to th think of these things in three parts. One, the, the fullness the, of capture. The second, the, the uh, standards with the, the file formats. And the third is uh, the bits, essentially ensuring um, that we have the bits in a way that, is, um, that, that they are intact. And, uh, and uh, Paul referred to this. It's a digital preservation effort. We, uh, in the community, in setting this up, we devoted a lot of effort to ensuring that that the bits were uh, were going to be intact. Right, that we were doing fixity checking. This is the term that we use uh, in this area. Uh, that we have multiple copies that we can check against the copies. 
Um, and so for me, it's always this three-legged tool, right? Stool, sorry, tool, stool. Um, the, the completeness, uh, the, the reliability of the capture of the, 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 uh, the standards of the file formats and the, uh, and, and the, uh, uh, and, and the, the bits, uh, ensuring that we, we keep those intact. And, and we paid attention to those things. In fact, the early years in the Google digitization were a process of, of trial and error, of testing what they were producing and rejecting what they were doing until uh, we came to the point where the capture was, was, was sufficiently full to be able to produce these derivatives that we use today. Um, behind the scenes, uh, new copies are brought in that improve old copies all the time. And, uh, and that is, I think, uh, something that is, uh, speaks to their, their, the science there. Um, Mike, you've had your hand raised. Uh, hi, I'm Mike Furlow. I'm director of Heidi Trust, and uh, I have a lot of footnotes, but I'm just going to address this quality question because I think it's John's point. Right, and just the last point was really an important one. Google has continued to refine its quality processes over the years, and so they have an ongoing commitment to reprocess images, reprocess materials for for improved OCR. They have spent a lot of money on research and improvement of, the, of OCR, uh, precisely because it serves their business interests. Uh, and we are the beneficiaries of that because we have an ongoing commitment to re-ingest those, those improved books. Um, I also think when we talk about quality, we have to ask this question about quality for what? What's the use case, right? And quality for legibility and readability was really the driving factor for the libraries in a, in a lot of this, you know, faithfulness to the, re to the original. The other thing I want to point out is that Paul's own research also showed that a lot of times catastrophic error became because there was a failure in the original print source. And we should not always presume that failure comes through digitization, but failure often comes from the, a faulty source file or a defaced source file. So there's a lot of different complexities and layers of quality that come into this. And I think what we have is you know, 18 million volumes that we can continue to iterate on, continue to refine and prove quality on over the years. Uh, it's not gonna be a cheap endeavor to do, but it's an ongoing commitment to that. So. Bert Mobert, do you see a role in the space for technologies like chat, GPT, and such that are getting a lot of publicity? And it really comes up around this whole trust issue, because right now the tools seem to have about the level of trust as a funny guy at the bar. And you know, it, it makes it hard for me to see how they ever get to a place that you could actually trust them at, like a research librarian. Mm -hmm. But what, what do you see It's the future? Paul, no, no, no. <laughs> so, I think that well, I think something like Chat GD, GPT, GPT, GPT yeah. is going to be out there, and you know, there's no question about that. And I think that um, various institutions and expertise, a lot of it academic expertise, will um, be working to figure out. Uh, how to develop trustworthy mechanisms to sort through what these things actually do. That's what happens when a, you know, a, new, a new technology comes along. Um, so I, I'm optimistic about the future. I'm optimistic about the ability of the academy to, to learn how things work and how to make them easy or more difficult, depending on what the desired outcome is. Uh, but. Um, that's, that's all, all I got for right now. <laughs> Good for you. Thanks. I'm Jack Bernard, and um, I, it's great to see you all here. And um, uh, th thanks for the nice comments. Uh, I'll, I'll start with some nice comments for you, too. Uh, you talked about trust, this idea of trust and how important it was. Uh, John and Paul sat through hours and hours and hours of depositions. They were they were deposed for hours. We prepped them for hours, um, and it it was the trust they inspired in their comments that I think inspired the the judges uh, to to view us favorably. They're, they are cited throughout the cases, and of course our case beget Google's opportunity to win. Uh, its case. And so really it, it is the trust that you inspired that I think helped uh, us win the day in the end and we really we appreciate that. 
Uh, as I sit back here, I'm, I'm looking at the panel from here, and I have pictures of both Paul and John with hair like Roger. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not me. <laughs> <laughs> I, if you had hair like that, Wendy, I never saw that. Um, so uh, what, I, what I was hoping you would comment on, and you know I could comment on this for quite some time, but um, you talked about the stool with three legs. Well, you, you, uh, you've all mentioned preservation as key and um, access through, through uh, search and research. But there was a third pillar to this project, which was access for people who had disabilities. And I'm hoping that the panel could talk a little bit about how important that kind of equity work is. Uh, I don't want to steal it. I mean, you want to talk about this? Well, it, it, it was a, it's a fun, fundamental part of what we were doing. From, from the beginning, we thought about, about this, built it into what we were doing. And, and I, I think um, for, for, for us, copyright law, um, fair use, uh, the provisions around fair use, the provisions around, around, um, around preservation, and, and Section 121, the rights for users uh, with print disabilities, were all things that were, were knit together. And, 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 uh, and I think in, in that, that lawsuit that the Authors Guild uh, brought against us, it was it was empowering to feel to, to represent those things as knit together, not letting them pick them apart and see uh, uh, all these things uh, knit together. So we uh, do provide access for users with print disabilities throughout uh, the the collective. We uh, allow the in, the in copyright materials to be downloaded and provided to them uh, to provide access to materials that they wouldn't otherwise be able to to use and uh, and. And that's, I think, uh, uh, bo both gratifying and also it feels like we, we haven't gone, a, you know, a hundredth of the way that we, we could and should there. I think there, there are too many impediments. Um, so. and, and the judge, I mean, the judge was persuaded by that uh, in a very, very strong, he was eloquent about it. Yeah. Um, I saw a hand over here and then one over here. Can please. I just uh, mention yeah, something that we probably will forget? Um, we spent countless hours in those depositions, but we spent many, many, many more hours in the settlement uh, uh, mm -hmm. negotiations trying to get something, and that came to naught, absolute nothing. And uh, I think that that's exasperating. I, I don't see anything good that's come out of that. Paul, do you? Is, is there anything? <laughs> I, I can't count the number of hours that, that you and Paul and I spent. Um, it, it was. I, I, it was just so much. So I, I, I think it actually painted some ways that we could, we could continue to move. I think mm -hmm. it allows us we could do something, something serious, experimental with with orphan works, which yeah. we haven't done, and that that, you know, we did talk about that a fair amount um, uh, in in the, the, in the settlement. Yeah, but but yeah, I think. And if there was, well, no, we didn't, we didn't wind up with anything we can use. Um, I think you're right. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, thanks for being here so much and, and um, sharing your expertise with us. I guess I would like to loop back to, we've gone through all of the history, we've touched on a few future-facing things, but the question on the board is, can a use of universal library be achieved? And so I'm wondering, tactically speaking, um, a universal library that's, you know, universally accessible and useful, technically speaking, what are our next steps? How do we do that in a way that's equitable? Our corpus, I think, is overwhelmingly westernized. It's overwhelmingly white. It's overwhelmingly um, those kinds of things that have been in the academic tradition. Where do we go from here? No, no. I, this, so... So this is exasperating for me. I think that there is a real opportunity for collective action in this space. And that collective action could address a lot of the, the, the deficiencies that you're talking about. So there, there are two parts for me. One is that we can come together to do this, and this has been a demonstration of that. And we've made a lot of progress, but there is so much more that can and should be done. 
by institutions coming together. So I mentioned the materials that are not there. Institutions should be deposited in their materials, but we should be working with parts of the world where there are uh, materials that wouldn't be represented in our libraries. So, so there's, there's an important effort to, to be made there. But the other piece that, that, that Paul touched on is the use piece. And, you know, I can't even begin to address that. I think uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, I think that's the, the holy grail. There's really the, the, the use piece there, Paul. Well, I mean, copyright reform, it's easy to imagine what a copyright reform would look like that would, would allow essentially something close to universal use. Uh, it gets more complicated as one adds more places that that we don't have source material from, so don't know much about it. It's clearly well within mission to learn about those and do better. Um, but but basically, um, one could I think one can rather easily imagine uh, a copyright regime um, in which things are much more open, much more usable uh, than they are now. Um, and I think that you can, in part, sell that regime because you can actually produce the things that libraries produce, access to all sorts of material previously published. Um, uh, if you have a more open system, it's actually, you know, textbooks are, I mean, lots of things wouldn't be as expensive as they are now. Um, they'd be more open as a result. Um, and I think there's a great deal of room in the industry to allow better, faster, cheaper um, as I said, so you know, I think that's what there ought to be. Somebody ought to ought to somebody ought to work on that. <laughs> I, I I also want to just add. I think that the published literature we can we can estimate the the success of some of these efforts by what share of the published literature has been collected, digitized, etc. Um, but the published literature has its own defects, and you pointed to some of them in your in your question. Um, I think some of the most exciting initiatives right now are moving beyond the published literature. We haven't done all the work that needs to be done with the published literature for all sorts of reasons that, mm -hmm. um, that, we've, that we've talked about in part tonight, but um, community archiving initiatives, um, various kinds of efforts to surface um, what are sometimes called uh, hidden collections within, within research libraries, um, uh, better describing them, better cataloging them, um, improving how they're represented through some collective um, initiatives that that tell a fuller story across institutions rather than what any single institution can tell uh, than the story that a, that a single institution can tell itself. There are some really exciting initiatives going on right now. Probably not not nearly enough of them, but um, but I think we've we've seen some. Um, some meaningful progress in, in recent years. And I think in a lot of ways, the progress that's been made with the published literature in terms of digitization and discovery and, and access, even limited though that access may be, I think has really um, blazed a path for, for, uh, for some of, some of the, um, the other kinds of materials. So, uh, so I think that's an, an, another element of, of this work that, that bears mention, even if it's not part of the, the sort of Google story exactly. Question over here. Thanks. Um, I worked for Paul for several years. As I was listening to him at the end, I was thinking, I recognize this. He's saying a lot of nice things. What he's really saying is get to work already. Um, <laughs> and so this is actually another version of what's next. Because um, I, I think thing all of you have said, you know, we, we've done this wonderful work, but there's so much to be done. And I'm wondering how you think about how we'll get there. Um, I'm, part of me is really hoping you'll say, get the band back together. Um, because I'd be a roadie again, and I'm <laughs> betting there's a bunch of people here that would sign up for that gig. Uh, but if we had a moment of, in time, how do we turn around and go, moment in time? Oh, this one, mm -hmm. right now. Um, what is... What's, what's our next step? <laughs> you find the right band. America's Got Talent. Uh. I don't want to be Debbie Downer here, but um, I, oh, I, I, I do think one of the things that, that um, 
I experienced not too long ago when the Big Ten was looking at how to combine all of its collections and make some rational choices about what got digitized, who kept what, who preserved what, and look at it as one collection. And the motivation was there, the intent was there, the enthusiasm, but each came from a different institution that cared about what the equivalent of a block M was on for their institution, mm -hmm. cared about whether they had the support, leadership, and resource base. So I, I, in my mind, it's also an institutional question. It's not bringing the band back together. Um, you know, it's, it's the agents <laughs> that also are responsible for the band and, and um, you know, how to get this to be seen as an institutional priority across many institutions. So, as I say, maybe that's a little too pessimistic, but I, I, I over and over again, you know, it's, well, I can't do that at my institution because. You probably would make a movie of a long painted <laughs> Yeah, <right. laughs> Well, maybe it's not a pessimistic response by, by making it institutional. Um, uh, uh, imperative, right? It's not about bringing the band back together. Um, so, how do you trust is you know the substantial body of material, and it does begin to and and there's a lot that's Western there, but that's it's much much broader than that. And so, maybe part of the answer is you know Mike and and the How do you Trust community beginning to use that as a way to um, to gap fill, if you will. Uh, and I know that that's probably. A necessarily unnecessarily pejorative way to describe things, but but we have a better sense of the landscape of the terrain. Part of it's mapped now, and we can see the parts that are not mapped, and and it becomes the the institutional imperative and the um, and 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 uh, an institutional imperative that can reach outside of our our cultural silos to to bring in other institutions. Um, the Council on Library and Information Resources now is working on hidden collections in Africa. Uh, uh, there's a, you know, there's a, um, a connection there that can be made to, to Hadi Trust and, uh, um, and Google and, and, uh, and more material could be brought in, that sort of thing, right? So using it as a linchpin. But I think it may also be it may also bear mention to say that the dilemma for research libraries today, in, in my view, is how to, um, in some ways, use all of the digitization um, foundation that, that so many of you here have been involved in building to take advantage of the opportunity to provide the kinds of knowledge services that academia needs today. And many of those are less about these great collections that have been built over the course of time and more about um, things like how to support the scientific research enterprise in the context of a, of a research university. And the question of how to position a research library to be able to serve that role um, while also taking a deep and sustained interest in the preservation and access of these collections, I think is, I, I believe is the, is the next generation's question to answer. Um, and I, I think that it's exciting to see how that, how that might, might come together. I think we have time for one more question or comment, if anybody has. Um, so I just really appreciate, there's something I appreciate about the three of you, right, is that this, there's so much um, that you've talked about here today, and it's all about the vision of libraries and the mission of libraries and, and the academic institution. There's a whole technology story that goes, you know, that was part of this. And we didn't, we hardly touched it today. And I, and I, and I appreciate that. It was always not the most important thing. And, um, and, and so I think even now talking about, like, what's next, it's about, it's about libraries. It's not about the technology, as important as that was, it's essential. Google's involved, but it's about libraries. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Any, any, any last reflections from anybody? Okay. I think what John Wise said. Yes, I, I, it was a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful wrap up. 
Okay, so thank you so much for this discussion, and again, for all coming here uh, to do this in person. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, we all, we, 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 we want to applaud you for tonight, but also uh, really thank you for the, just the tremendous work that you all put in, uh, have put in in all of this. Uh, thanks to the audience for all of the engagement. Again, uh, it's a wonderful book. It's available both in print and in <laughs> e-book form, so I, I highly recommend it. I want to thank Andrew Rutledge for monitoring the YouTube uh, uh, stream, the Michigan media team. Uh, and just remind you, we're open every Friday night for Astronomy Night and uh, most Thursday nights for events uh, uh, along these lines. Uh, this session will be available on YouTube uh, in about a week. Uh, so thank you all. The observatory is still open if you want to go upstairs for a little bit. Uh, and until we all see you again, be safe, uh, stay well, and keep hope. Thank you. <laughs>